and hello guys um you know there's there's been a lot of talk about uh, abortion in the last few weeks if you haven't noticed and i, I don't expect that to change uh, apparently there's been a a draft of the u.s supreme court opinion leaked and in that opinion in that opinion it addresses the court's supposed desire uh, to overturn the effects of of Roe, uh, handling or handing the the abortion issue over to the states, I I say supposedly because I, I never count my chickens until they're hatched. So let's see, uh, let's see what uh, I guess transpires over the next couple of weeks, and we actually get the opinion out. But we can talk about the issue. You know, abortion is one of those topics that always attracts conversation. Whenever I post something on social media about abortion, I um, I'm, I'm almost guaranteed to get a ton of comments on it. Uh, people come out of the woodwork. And today on To The Point, I'm going to address some specific comments that I received on my Facebook page in response to a graphic I posted. And at the at the end of 15 minutes, I hope that you'll have a better understanding of an argument, but you'll also be better equipped to do two things. Uh, the first is I'm hoping that you'll be able to spot the argument when we see it. And the second... Um, you'll be able to better answer one of the more difficult arguments raised in favor of abortion or uh, for the pro-choice uh, position. So I'm John Noyes. This is To The Point. It's my bi-weekly live video where I seek to address a, a culturally relevant uh, topic or issue from a distinctly Christian world view. And then during this uh, whole time, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes I would love it if you would uh, add some comments into the comments section. I'm going to actually turn that on right now so I can see them. Um, I love seeing that you guys are here. Hey, Steve, how's it going, man? Claiming Christianity. And uh, and add the comments, add any questions that you might have in the in the sidebar, in your comment bar, and whatever platform you're using. And at the end of my time uh, just presenting, kind of, I'll go through and answer them. So um, my my... My principle of every time I say something on social media about uh, abortion, I, I get a ton of responses proved uh, true two weeks ago, about 11 or 12 days ago when I posted, let me see if I can get it on the screen. I posted this graphic. Um, <laughs> I posted this graphic on my Facebook page and uh, it, it's a fairly clear graphic, right? This is um, your body and it shows the body of the woman. And then this is the body of someone else. And it shows the, the body of the growing unborn, uh, baby, the fetus in the mother's, uh, womb. Well, in her stomach, but technically medically it's in her womb. So this picture is, is actually meant to clearly show that there are two bodies involved in a woman's pregnancy, which invalidates the, the popular objection. Sometimes you'll see it on signs, the, my body, my choice, kind of argument for abortion that seems to be one of the most popular uh, arguments for the pro uh, pro choice position or the pro abortion position my body my choice this graphic that i posted speaks to that pretty clearly there's two bodies there now i'm going to focus on a on a few specific comments by one of my friends on social media and uh, i'm going to read some of the the comments and i i want you to keep them in mind as i then respond so um, this is this is what my my friend said. He said, agreed. He agrees with the the posting. He says, agreed. This is your body. This is the body of someone else. And then he says, agreed. And someone else does not have a right to use your body without your consent. And he goes on to say, I'll, I'll, I'll give anyone reading this enough respect to assume they know the difference between taking care of another person and allowing another person to physically use their body. And now I'm going to offer two more quotes. This one's pretty short. He says bodily autonomy, right here. We had hear that term bodily autonomy isn't just a made up rule. It's a fundamental right. Now keep that in mind as, as, uh, as we seek to address these issues. And then this is a longer quote from him, but I think it's important. Consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. And there are many cases where sex is not consented to either. I'm willing to grant the same rights to the fetus. Now, this is really important. Pay attention to this. I'm willing to grant the same rights to the fetus as to the mother. The fetus absolutely has a right to life, just as every born human does. But in no case whatsoever does a human have a right to life through the use of someone else's body. Taking away a woman's right to terminate a pregnancy does two things. He goes on to say, first one, it gives special rights to the fetus. 
which can range from a, a clump of cells <laughs> to a fully formed baby. Okay. Two, it takes away the right of bodily autonomy for the woman. This is this is government control of a woman's bodily autonomy, and it's a terrifying road to go down when we start talk, taking away rights that have been protected by the Constitution. Now, this is uh, formally what's known as the bodily autonomy argument. He's, he uses that term a couple times, my friend, on social media. And he expresses it clearly when he said someone else does not have the right to use your body without your consent. He went on to say, in no case whatsoever does a human have a right to life through the use of someone else's body. Now, first things uh, first, let's be clear, this is not a new argument. Uh, not, a, not at all. This argument came to uh, prominence in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, and was really made popular by Judith, Judith, Judith Jarvis Thomas in her article, A Defense of Abortion. Uh, you can find that article online. Maybe Harmony could link you to it in the comments here. And you can read it yourself. It's not very long. It'll take you a couple minutes to read. And she offers this argument. And, and then she actually goes on to write a book in the, by the same title, a defense of abortion. And, uh, the argument is, is pretty simple. It, it's presented here, um, really clearly. And it's actually, in my opinion, is, is probably in the most difficult pro-life argument to address, but there are answers and there is a way to address it. Uh, there are two reasons I think that this is a difficult challenge for us to answer. And the first is actually a good thing. The first uh, has to do with that there's a there's a lot um, thrown at us um, and there's a lot of uh, facets and, and and sometimes we don't know which ones to focus on but that's good because uh, it gives us a lot to work with second is actually another good thing um, and there's a lot of common ground actually there's a lot given so as, as somebody as somebody throws a lot into their argument they also I mean the, the expression I guess is the you give them enough rope to hang themselves with it, right? The more they offer, the better, because it gives us more to work with. And the second thing is, is that we actually find ourselves on a lot of common ground, um, which is which makes uh, discussion easier. You know, most of the popular arguments in favor of abortion are question begging. You know, uh, what's that? This this means that they assume that the unborn is not a human being. So so they assume the very thing that they're trying to prove. So for example, my body, my choice, or, or um, more women will die from illegal abortions, or even what about the case of rape? And all of these arguments, when they're brought up, assume that the that the thing that's um, inside the mother is not a human being. And that's why we we train ourselves. This is a pro-life tactic. Uh, Scott Klusendorf made it really popular in his book, A Case for Life, which is fantastic. We ask that one fundamental question, um, what is the baby? Because if it, what is it that abortion does? Is it taking the of an innocent human life? If so, uh, that changes the equation and all of those address, uh, uh, objections that I just mentioned. But this argument is different, an argument from bodily autonomy. Um, you see, all the other objections assume the fetus is in a living, growing, unique human life. That's why, uh, like I said, the fundamental question that we always should be raising is, what is the unborn? Because if it's, a, if it's human, um, the intentional taking of its life is, is murder. I just want to reiterate that. It's cl clear. Now, this isn't the case here. Uh, the the bodily autonomy argument or the argument from bodily autonomy, it grants that the fetus is a living human being. And often the one using the argument even grants um, grants that the fetus has rights. And this is what my friend did. I'm willing to grant the same rights to the fetus as to the mother is what he says. So we can use this in our arguments. So so let's look at the argument. The, the central claim here is, let me get this graphic gone because uh, now here we go. The, the central claim here is that the mother um, has an absolute right to do whatever she wants with her own body, regardless of the consequences to the fetus in her womb. And, and in the case of the violinist example that um, Thomas brings up, if you read that article, abortion is is simply the, the attaching uh, of the, the mother from her child. And this is what my friend is basically saying. He says that someone else does not have a right to use your body without your consent. And, and bodily autonomy isn't just a made up rule. It's a fundamental right. But does the woman have a right to not allow her baby access to her body? Does this translate into the, the woman's right to end the child's life uh, through abortion? I, I don't think so. And, and so I'm going to give a couple of reasons why. Uh, first, the argument assumes that there's no moral obligation for the woman to sustain the life in her womb. You know, this is a, actually a, a really strange line of thinking uh, in my mind. By definition, moral obligations are non-consensual. 
right? That that's what um that's what makes them obligations and and not just suggestions. Actually, you know, if, if mothers aren't obligated to care for their unborn child when um, when they're uh, in their womb, what obligates them to to care for their their born children? You know, is is a is a mother even morally obligated to provide life sustaining care for her uh, grown child? If so, when does that obligation start? Um, why then, and 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 at that point in time, do we all, all of a sudden put that obligation on top of a woman and 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 not in utero? What changes? Well, according to the the bodily autonomy argument, and this is where it's really important that we find ourselves on common ground because we can use what they're saying. Because according to the person bringing the bodily autonomy argument, nothing changes. My friend wrote in, in his comments, I'm willing to grant the same rights to the fetus as to the mother. The fetus absolutely, he says, the fetus absolutely has a right to life, just as every born human does. You know, the person bringing the argument agrees that the unborn is a living human being. So the mother has the same moral obligations to her fetus as she does towards the unborn. Intent and conception, by the way, does nothing to change this. If they want to say it does, if they want to claim that that the, the means or the consent of conception changes the, the moral obligation to care for that child, they have to provide a reason for that view. And most of the time when pressed, they can't. That's the first part. Second, the argument uh, assumes that the fetus is an intruder and uh, her presence is, is, a, is negative. And this is just simply false. The fetus is not an intruder regardless of intent. The, the human being is exactly where that human being should be at that time. And, uh, th and this is another curious um, line of argumentation for me because for a mother to view her unborn child as a parasite or, or, um, or a, a, an intruder is, is, in my mind, itself a, a moral evil. But this is really another discussion that we should have maybe during another video. Uh, third. The argument equates ab abortion to merely the withholding of care. And this is a major point here. This is this is something that you want to spend some time with if you're going to try to press back at your friends here. The um, Essentially, uh, this is what my friend was, was meaning when he wrote, I'll give anyone reading this enough respect to assume they know the difference between taking care of another person and allowing another person to physically use their body. They're conflating, or he in this instance is conflating uh, the, the, the withholding of care, care with abortion. And I don't think that follows because I think this ignores uh, the distinction between withholding care and actively seeking to kill another human being, which is what abortion is, the intentional taking of an innocent human life. This is very important. It's like this. It, it'd be one thing for a mother to refuse to donate um, an organ or, or blood to her dying child. And even that, I think we could raise... Uh, some questions about, but it's it's quite another thing altogether for that mother to actively intentionally kill her child by uh, burning, <laughs> scraping, or dismemberment. You uh, withholding of care is not the same thing as abortion. And ab when you have an abortion, it is a seek and destroy mission. The intention of that action of that procedure is singular. There's one purpose of an abortion, and that is to take the life of that living human being. There's there's no gray area on this. If, if, if the only way someone can withhold care is by actively killing another human being, uh, they're just simply not permitted to do it. Uh, fourth, notice often a, a major part of the argument is to do with consent. And my friend wrote this. He said, the consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. He's right, right? The um, the argument is that just because the couple consents to sex doesn't mean they consent to pregnancy. Well, this is completely true. And actually, when you look at the literature, uh, a large portion of, of pregnancies are, are un, unplanned, you know, accidental. Uh, if you're watching this, you may have experienced one of these uh, accidental or unplanned pregnancies. But, the, but there's more going on here. Uh, it's it's the idea that due to a lack of consent, the woman has a right to use deadly force to stop the fetus from using her body to sustain the fetus's own life. This this simply doesn't follow. Uh, many many of the choices we make have consequences that we don't consent to. 
but we're forced to accept them and go th and suffer the consequences. Uh, this is this is uh, for example, this is why we sign um, informed consent forms uh, uh, for a medical procedure. You know, you're consenting to having a, a tooth pulled out. You got to sign that paper. And, and the reason why you're signing it, one part of signing that is that you're acknowledging there may be undesirable consequences. And, and by consenting to the procedure, and this is foundational here, by, presenting, by consenting to this procedure, you're not accepting the possible consequences. You're just acknowledging that they're there. The same is true for consensual sex. We consent to things we have control over uh, here, sexual intercourse. We don't consent to the consequences, but we acknowledge that they're there. And uh, this is this is a major uh, issue with our current culture, which I don't have time to get into today. But uh, this, uh, you know, the sexual revolution brought this this uh, this about where all of a sudden there there are no consequences, or sex has lost its telos, its meaning, its purpose, um, and and any moral grounding behind it. A thought for another time, maybe. Uh, and finally, as I kind of wrap up here, the the argument is is only compelling if the woman has an absolute right to do whatever she wants with her own body regardless of the impact on the human life in her womb. Uh, this, friends, is clearly false. Uh, people can never do whatever they want with their own bodies, including pregnant women. And, and we see this all over the place. Uh, we see it, for example, when, when a pregnant woman um, demands uh, a, a doctor to prescribe certain medicine, the one that I have on my mind right now, uh, or, or medicine that causes uh, def deep birth defects like, uh, like Accutane. You know, if, if a woman who uses Accutane, which is a drug that is has serious side effects for the fetus, becomes pregnant, does her doctor then have, have the obligation, <laughs> I'll use that word, obligation to keep prescribing her that drug regardless of the effects that it's going to have on, her, on, on the fetus? Of course not. You know, even, even, if, uh, even if the woman demands it, the doctor can say no. And it's actually more than that. Uh, the U.S. government, in order to get a prescription to Accutane, uh, requires women to 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 provide proof of two forms of contraception uh, they use before they'll even give the prescription. And uh, upon becoming pregnant, uh, it, it, it's illegal for a doctor to prescribe the mother the the drug, and and it's also illegal for the pharmacy to fill the prescription if she does happen to have an old one or or have the prescription. You know, th this is a this is an example of a woman seeking to do something with her own body that actually has a desirable and, and beneficial effect, but, uh, but she has, but, but she has no recognized right to be given that medicine, uh, even at the threat of violating her, her right to bodily autonomy, even when it's supported by the U S government Notice that because my, my friend did mention, you know, this is a, a scary road to walk. We've been rocking down this road for a long time. We cannot, ever do whatever we want with our own bodies. And, and the only justification for this, uh, because the, the medication in this example will have damaging effects on the fetus. So the, the, the reason or the rationale behind it is the reason why we're limiting bodily autonomy isn't because of the beneficial effects or the effects that'll have on the, on the mother, but we're limiting bodily, the, the right of the mother to her, the rights of her own body because of the effects they'll have on the fetus. This is something that's already recognized. It's already out there. The, the, the mother's claim to, to bodily autonomy, it's important. Don't get me wrong, but it's not absolute and it doesn't supersede her obligation to, to her unborn child. So, so I hope that this, the last, uh, I learned a little bit over the last 19, 18 minutes, um, brought a little bit of clarity to the bodily autonomy argument. And as the, as the U.S. Supreme Court wrestles with Roe v. Wade and, and the opinions made official, the, the, um, and uh, I'm sure that the public is going to have an outcry no matter how it goes, right? Uh, so that means our work as Christ's ambassadors isn't going to get any easier. <laughs> it's going to be essential, guys. It's going to be essential for us to be able to articulate our position and defend the pre-born, regardless of the justification for abortion. We should be able to address each and every claim according to the claim. Uh, remembering also that the, every time somebody brings it, the claim to you, there is a person there. And I, I want to end this portion of it just by saying, hey, if, uh, if you're watching this and you have uh, had an abortion, if that's the choice that you've made, I want to let you know that there is forgiveness for you. Uh, we oftentimes forget this as Christians, that we have to be mentioned. There is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And uh, there is forgiveness. And the forgiveness is in the cross of Christ. And, uh, and, and he wipes away all our sins. We are washed clean by the blood of Christ. 
And uh, if you've made that decision to have an abortion, uh, I am so sorry. And and uh, there's a lot of people who want to walk with you through the healing process, I'm sure. Uh, if you're thinking about having an abortion, I, I beg of you to please uh, reconsider. I guarantee you there are resources available to you through a local church, through a pregnancy center. Um, and uh, there's options. And oftentimes you don't know that. There's people, I know that because I'm one of them, that would be willing to walk with you through whatever challenges you think are insurmountable. I promise you that there's solutions to them. So reconsider. And uh, with that, guys, I'm going to I'm gonna look at the comment section and, and see what we got going on. I'm going to look down here because my computer's down here. And um, let's see here. Uh, natural, natural Gee, hey, man, it's good to see you. Um, let's see. Uh, claiming Christianity. Hey, SDR, I'm PM'd on FB because I have a tech nerd question. When you get a chance. Okay. Uh, that's definitely not for me. So Harmony, maybe you could, uh, you could hit up uh, claiming Christianity. Um, <laughs> let me look at this background. So guys, I am at the, uh, the, the stand the reason studio uh, today, because I'm actually going to be going to university, UC Irvine to do some, um, some video and filming there right after this. So I'm going to jam in, in a couple minutes, but, um, oh man, I love it. Look at this. We've got greetings from Australia. I love it when there's like so many people watching. This is so cool. Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, great topic. It, it, is it really the women's body? Yeah, that's right. We got to be asking that. And if it's not the women's body, what is it? Uh, the way that I demonstrate that is like when I'm talking to people and they bring up the, uh, they bring up uh, my body, my choice argument, which leads to the bodily autonomy. But I, I like to point out that there's two bodies there. And I'll say if, if, if like at, at, at any given moment, does the mom have, you know, 20 toes or 20 fingers or does the mom all of a sudden have a have male genitalia? <laughs> uh, clearly not. Right. Because there's a, there's a unique individual human being uh, growing inside the mother. It's just a clear case, uh, in my opinion. Nobody. I don't think I, I there's I don't I've never seen somebody address that issue uh and anything approaching a satisfactory way so anyways okay um let's see here uh you make sure you guys check out these links here that are that are placed here because um tim barnett he does some stuff i think this is probably his his uh red pen logic uh, one of my colleagues tim barnett if you don't follow red pen logic you should and uh they're they're gonna all be there oh this is uh how Howard is this Howard HWD 71? I don't know. I watched Scott Klusendorf and Lisa Children's channel. Great episode. Yeah, they 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 address this. I mean, Klusendorf, almost of this information is probably from uh, Klusendorf at some point. And actually, he got a lot of stuff from from uh, Kokel too. So uh, but great resource. Make sure you you read his book. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's doing a great job um, over there at the Life Training Institute. Uh, Megan Allman is another one. If Megan Allman, uh, we just had her at all of our reality conferences this year and she speaks on abortion uh, worldwide and she is unreal check her out megan allman um and her husband trip he speaks on the problem of evil and does a lot they both do a lot of ministry at summit ministries um lots of links in here natural gee hey okay let's see let's see questions let's if you got questions put them in here let's see um michael lowe john would love your thoughts about my article about this topic uh, directly. Absolutely, you know if you if you shoot it to me through um, f through Facebook, I don't check it that often, but I do check my private messenger every once in a while, and I I'll I'll make sure I do that. If you're still watching, put it in my face. Go to my Facebook page, uh, private message me, and I'll make sure I look at it tonight. And uh, and I'd love to love to take a look at it. Like any good resource, I'm always open to. Um, let's see agreed I, I i bought the case for life after first discovering mr klusendorf on way of the master yeah uh good book you want to get the book it's case for life uh, you could probably actually go to str.org and go to our bookstore and order it um I, I i guarantee you just like 50 feet from where i'm sitting we have copies of it um oh uh Awesome, Michael. I see that you linked it here. Uh, still, try to send it. I don't know if this comment's going to stay on my face on the Facebook page. If it, it, so, shoot me a shoot me a link. It'd be great. Um, <laughs> not during this stream, of course. Yeah, 
let's see here. Fantastic comments by the, by the end. Awesome. Um, will do. Yeah. So I don't see a ton of questions guys. So I'll hang out for a couple of minutes, um, and, uh, and see harmony, make sure you, if you see some questions that I'm missing or something, let me know. And, um, but this is, uh, um, oh, Scott's book. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Harmony. So, uh, this is, this is the, the abortion issue is I think one of the, obviously the watershed issues of our day. Um, I was recently, I don't know if I've told you guys the story before, but I'll end with this if there aren't any more. Oh, question. Hold on before I say that. Let's see here. Came in a little late, but what's the best way to deal with persons in support of abortion who are hostile towards the pro-life stance? Okay. Um, yeah, well, there's one, and I think it's important to understand that there's no, um, there's no magic bullet. So if you're talking about a friend or a family member that you really want to dialogue with, there's nothing, there's no magic bullet that's going to all of a sudden bring them over to your side. But I would say, um, what's the best way to deal with a person in support of abortion who's hostile to questions? I always go with questions because you kind of, when you, when you start asking the questions about the people from the people that are, that are hostile, you kind of put them at ease, ask them the Columbo questions. You know, why, what exactly is it that you, that you believe, or you say, if they're getting upset, I say, whoa, whoa, it seems like this, this struck a nerve. Is there a reason why ask them why they're, they're kind of getting excited or, or intense about it, but do it genuinely. You see, in my opinion, the, the key to having a good conversation with somebody is to actually be interested in the person. Not not a feigned interest, or you're not just concerned about getting facts in their head or or winning an argument, but you're actually interested in their position. You want to hear them out. So become interested in the person. Ask questions. Hey, last time we had this discussion, it, it kind of ended badly. On a, a, like I, it seemed, I just felt a little angst by it. And I just want to clear that up. I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. It's a hard issue, but I was wondering maybe you could explore and explain to me a little bit more what 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 you believe and why you believe it. You see, those are the first two Columbo questions. Um, it's a great way to kind of take the pressure off and just say, hey, I just want to have a conversation and, and I want to learn what you think to be true and why you think that because uh, because I'm interested in you and I care about you. You know, um, as far as arguments go, I, I, I think always coming back, you know, what is the unborn, right? Very, very, very important. What is the unborn? Because oftentimes, like even my friend, who's who's a really smart guy, he's a really great guy too, nice guy. Uh, he says, you know, it, 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 the fetus range is from a clump of cells to uh, a, a baby, or I forget, or a, a, an unborn baby. I think was his words. Well, <laughs> an unborn baby is just a clump of cells too, right? But the life begins, right? So, so it's a good opportunity for us to help educate people too. So, oftentimes, the people who get upset, like your friend they just might not know the, the facts of, of embryology and biology. Maybe I'm not saying that to be, um, it's not like pejorative or it's not, uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that to be mean spirited or anything or, or hoity. I'm just saying, you know, oftentimes I didn't, when I was, when I was a uh, pro abortion, I used to be pro abortion. Uh, I didn't necessarily know the facts. I would have said, no, 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 no. It's just a clump of cells. It's not a living organism. Or I, I would have said, well, there's living organisms in your spit. Like, should we not kill those either? Like, should you not step on any spit on the side? Because those are human cells, you know, and, and I didn't understand the difference. You know, that's actually a unique human being that's that's growing. And, and that's that's uh, that's science. And that's why actually uh, often people who are for, informed, like uh, like the the woman that, that, that Miss Thomas and and others who have gone after her since 1971 when she published that article and, and also my friend from online. Uh, when that's oftentimes why why people bring up the bodily autonomy argument because they grant they have to grant that this is a unique human being so what other argument can they oh well, who cares and then they have to then you can go in there with sled you know then that's klusendorf so still answering this question easy for you to say you know um you know uh what at what point does that living organism that human that's growing inside of you or inside of the mother have value and worth and and say, well, you know, size, level of development, environment, uh, degree of dependency, right? That's sled. None of those things lend value to the human being um, for obvious reasons, right? We're all different sizes. We're all we're all in different environments. We um, we we're all in different stages in life and levels of development. You know, um, where you know we all have different dependencies. A, a newborn baby is is less dependent. I mean, it's more dependent on their mother than than I am, certainly right? 
So these things are just important to get to know. And um, I find the best way, if somebody's being hostile, uh, move on from the conversation at that moment. Maybe not from the person totally, but calm things down. You know, just stay. Hey, it's not because because if they get upset, if they're getting upset, you're not going to win. And, and nobody really wins. So I hope that helps a little bit. There's uh, there's a couple other uh, comments here. Let's see. Megan Ullman's talk on abortion. Okay. Let's see. I heard that the oh, question. Here we go. How would you answer the objection that pro-life violates a woman's medical right to privacy? Thank you. <laughs> I'd ask a question. How 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 does a pro-life position interfere with a uh, women's right to privacy? Because uh, I'm not asking to gain uh, information about her medical situation. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't know how I I've never, that, that argument's never been brought up. It's like against HIPAA or whatever. I mean, I think that in this case, you, you, we educate and we, we go back to the position like, well, what exactly is this happening in the case of an abortion while well, you're pregnant with a unique human being, you know, an individual is growing inside of you. What about that? Uh, what about the fetuses? Uh, right to, to medical privacy or privacy. Uh, you could go the route of what we just talked about, you know, bodily autonomy, because I think that they they might straddle each other a little bit and just say, well, I mean, d d d by, by, uh, by saying that a, a mother should not be able to have unfettered access to abortion uh, is, is the same, like same thing as saying like, well then, or, or you could bring up why would, why do we offer, or why do we restrict women's access to certain medications when she's pregnant for the, for the sole reason on, of the effects that they have on the fetus. What's interesting is oftentimes when these, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't say this to people like necessarily, unless I know the person, but oftentimes <clears throat> what's interesting is somebody will bring up the bodily autonomy argument or, or this type of thing, the objection to a pro-life violates women's medical right to privacy. A person who brings this up in, in, in one breath will bring this argument up, but in the next breath, they'll also uh, point out if they see a woman, a pregnant woman drinking or, or smoking and they'll object to that and they'll object to it uh, <laughs> on, on the basis of the health of the fetus, not the mother. So like, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? That consistency matters in this, in this, uh, in this area. But yeah, if, if violating a woman's right to medical privacy, I'm not sure what that, I mean, uh, we're not looking to make women's medical records pregnant. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make abortions illegal. Abortions should be illegal. You know, the, it, it is always wrong to take the life of an innocent human being. Um, and we should do whatever we can to combat that. So, um, so I don't know how that would violate a woman's right to medical privacy. Um, so it, you know, anyways, I hope that helps. Uh, Awesome. Let's see here. Um, hey, John, is there a link to your Facebook? Just, uh, just um, if you search me, Jonathan Noise, you should you should be able to find uh, my my Facebook page. A uh, question. Let's see. Awesome. Uh, question: If a woman has a high risk pregnancy where she and the baby are at risk, and she is constantly in pain and ill, and chooses to have an abortion, is it a sin? I uh, the natural gee. This is a hard question. It's, it's hard, uh, not because I think it has a, a, a hard an answer. It's emotionally difficult. Uh, yes, I think it's a sin. Um, again, uh, all of our sins are forgiven. A past, present, and future by Jesus Christ. So uh, the, the, the question is, is, is the abortion in this instance morally permissible? From my understanding and from the, the, word, the things that I've read, the literature I've read, uh, um, an, um, uh, an ab ab abortion and ab abortions are almost always never medically necessary. I mean, we're talking about the, the vast minority of the case in the situation that you have, uh, <laughs> you actually kind of described my, my wife's pregnancy. Uh, she, uh, for three of the four babies, she was high risk. Uh, Phoebe, my second oldest, she tried to come really early. So she was on uh, Eva. I mean, um, Rihanna had to be given progesterone shots uh, once a week to uh, stave off the labor, uh, the contractions. And those those hurt. 
and she wasn't feeling fantastic. And uh, her doctor, her first doctor was really great. Uh, he used to say, um, cause she had, she wasn't feeling good with, with Eva, my oldest, and it was rough. And so she, he always said, well, I'm sorry, Rihanna, but, but pregnancy is riddled with discomfort is what, what he used to tell her. And I used to love it. And, uh, and because it was good, it was good for Rihanna to hear that he was a good doctor for her. But anyways, uh, you know, pregnancy is, is, is uh, um, can be hard. It's hard for a lot of people, but just because it's hard, does that justify the taking of the innocent human life? Um, and these are, these are hard decisions. Like that's the other thing I, I want to be clear that, that I know that these are hard decisions. They're very personal, very emotional and there are consequences to them. But just because pregnancy is really hard and maybe you're really sick and you're high risk and you have to stay in bed for 10 weeks, you can't do anything and you, whatever it might be, does that justify the taking of that innocent human life? And I, I would say in, in does, does having a, a hard life struggling through life justify the taking of uh any other child's life a two-year-old child uh, you know you could you could say this is the same thing right you're you uh you're having a really difficult time in life in general you're not feeling well at all you're stressed out to the max like seriously stressed uh medically depressed clinically depressed because uh one of those one of the uh, um, contributing factors is maybe a, a, a child is in a particular stage of life that's extremely difficult. Is it appropriate or ever warranted to take the life of that child? Of course not. Um, the same is true for the for the unborn child. So um, these are these are hard. I think I think oftentimes, certainly in the realm of Christian apology, Christian apologetics, I feel like we lead into these conversations. Thanks for this uh, natural key. Um, we can be kind of cold. And we want to make sure we don't lose that. And I think I said it earlier, right? Behind every one of these objections, behind every one of these uh, statements, behind every one of these arguments is, is a person. Um, and, and you don't know what that person's been through or is going through. Uh, I used to stand regularly. I used to stand outside of a, an abortion mill um, and, and do pro-life apologetics there and hoping to, to talk to people. But um, I heard like horror stories. You know, I mean, just absolutely, like, I mean, a lot of the time, I mean, some of the time it's just totally elective abortions and, and women are like, whatever, you know, I, I, I've, I've talked to a woman and her husband, literally they had two kids in the car and she was being dropped off to have an abortion. And, uh, and the guy, anyways, it was, it was not a good scene. And they were just like, we want to do what we want. I don't care. And like, there's certainly that, but the, most of the people that I speak with, most of the people that I've spoken to are, are in a hard place. It's, it's not easy. And they don't come to these decisions lightly. So I think it's good for us to have empathy and lead with that empathy and, and compassion uh, for people and not ever, um, you know, uh, at the cost of truth. But I, I think oftentimes in Christian apologetics, we come across as cold, um, you know, and, and then it's important also to become informed, you know, understand in your area, if you're going to, if you're going to have these conversations with somebody, understand the resources that are available to you in your area. Like in my area, I know that I personally know personally, I have their phone numbers in my phone, lawyers and, and doctors and uh, who will help for free. I have people that are willing to house a young lady and um, it, it, for up to nine months after the birth of her child. Um, so stuff like that. I've got people that will help with adoptions for free. So it's good to have those resources available. So when you do talk to somebody and then they bring up like one of those objections, which I think are valid objections, are you going to help out? I'm like, yes, I want to help out. How can I help? Let's hear the resources that are available. So anyways, those are just some, some side thoughts there. Um, another question here. How would you answer the objection that unless you adopt all the unwanted children, then it's better to adopt the unborn than have them live a miserable unwanted lives? Thank you. Well, one, uh, there's a lot that goes into this. <laughs> Like uh, you're, there's, there's the, there's the assumption, unwarranted assumption that, that the, the birth of that child is all of a sudden going to be, um, uh, result in a miserable, unwanted life, which is just not the case because what happens is, is oftentimes in this instance, what, what happens is, is the person that's bringing this objection up has in mind the foster system, which I think is, 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 is in a lot of ways, very broken. My wife is a product of the foster system. She was an orphan. So. <laughs> so what we, what we think of is we think, oh, well, we're forcing this woman to have this baby and then she's going to be forced to give it in the foster care. When actually that's really not the case. The foster system isn't, uh, isn't 
comprised of all of these unwanted babies. There are waiting lists for people wanting to adopt um, babies. So that's it. So, so it, right there, you, if, if you understand that you take the sting out of the subjection because the, the miserable unwanted lives component just doesn't, it's not there. <clears throat> and, and, and then flipping on its head. So, so what the option, so it's better, so it's better to, to kill that, that person. If it's, if, if it's unwanted, if, if he is unwanted and he is, he's having a miserable life, trot out the toddler. So is it okay? For a mother, if who doesn't want, if a mother doesn't want her two-year-old anymore, and the their life is is at the current situation miserable, they're living in poverty and squalor, and and can't do anything right. Is it acceptable now to kill that two-year-old? Why or why not? Of course, it's not because that's a that's a, a, a human being, you know. And so, what makes that human being different in as as far as value and dignity from the unborn? human being you know so that's how i'd answer these types of objections um or unless you adopt all of the i mean how does that follow so 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 uh am so unless i'm able to save in, unless i'm able to rescue all of the young women trapped in sexual slavery i shouldn't try to save one i mean do you see do you see how that that just falls apart on its face you know it it, it really does the issue that goes on here is is, is we become distracted with these things because people it goes back to kind of like what i said before um people lose sight of what it is that abortion is and the an abortion results in the taking of an innocent human life what is the unborn you know, if, if it's a clump of cells, then fine. These objections, fine. Like whatever. If it's just like the equivalent of a, of a mole or a wart or a growth or whatever, then fine. And then on a moral scale, but it's more than that. So I, I like to, when I'm having these discussions face to face, I, I flush these things out, you know, unless I'm able to adopt all the unwanted babies. Well, do I, why does this, why is this standard apply to a, abortion, but not sex trafficking you know why is this a standard apply to abortion but not anything else of course that's not the case um so that's how i i would i would start with that is um natural gee agrees with me thank you um sad but excellent topic yes it is it is sad <clears throat> but um but we need to be speaking into it. and actually this is one of those instances where we're actually seeing abortion rates declining which is a which is which is a, a major um, win. I mean, there's still far too many abortions every year, but at least we're seeing decline uh, declines in them. So I'm going to do one more peruse here of uh, <laughs> Grandma Joe. <laughs> I love it, <laughs> keeping it real. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to do one more kind of peruse, and then I really do have to get going because I'm actually going to be filming. Uh, University of California Irvine today uh, just trying to talk to some students and get some answers and stuff it's gonna be a lot of fun um, I think I hit everything up and Harmony will tell me if I didn't um, as I'm scrolling through here guys I want to remind you that if you want more resources on this stuff you can always go to str.org um, this has been one of those topics because it's so fundamental because it's a watershed issue str has written and produced a lot of material on it um, and we'll go to str.org. You can search our videos. You can search our blog. Um, and uh, I don't know if we have an STRU class. If you guys aren't enrolled in STRU, you've got to. So str.org backslash training. Um, that's STRU. These are free multi-part classes or courses. There's multi-class courses that are available to you for free. And each course is followed by a, a, a little test thing. So you can actually see if you're picking up what we're throwing down and test your knowledge. And it, it's another way that, that we can help train you uh, to be able to bring these issues, not just so they list as mental ascent, but you can actually bring these issues out into the culture around you and start um, winning the culture, making culture and pushing back. Um, and uh, so, so STRU, I'm trying to think of the other thing, uh, guys, oh my gosh, um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the reality conference, student apologetics conference, the links to register for next season are already up. 
They're already active. You can go on there and register for the Orange County. We've got Orange County, Seattle, uh, Dallas, Texas. We've got Minneapolis, Minnesota. We've got uh, Augusta, Georgia, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, all of those links are active. Those registration links are active and live. So you can go register now. Um, just so you guys are aware, Orange County in September, that's our first one. It sells out every single year. Seattle, the last two years have sold out, or at least this last year sold out. Um, I can't remember if last year was the COVID year or not, um, but it sold out. Minneapolis is always space in just because we're in a huge venue. I think it holds like 5,000 people, but last year we had over 3,000 there. Um, uh, the, the Dallas always sells out. Uh, Philadelphia was new and we were probably 80% sold and, um, Augusta, Georgia was brand new too. And that was pretty full, um, probably 75% full. So if you guys uh, want to get registered for our reality conferences, make sure you do it. You don't need to be a student. It'd be great if you brought some students, but it doesn't matter. I've, I've actually met some of you guys who watch at these reality conferences. It's a great opportunity for you guys to get to know us. Um, so SGRU, SGR.org, reality conferences. Um, if you guys want to bring this type of presentation and more about abortion or any other uh, hot button issue, we are happy to come to your churches or a conference, whatever you're putting together. Um, and you can contact us just through our web page. Um, go to click training, get training, and you'll see our names there. And I, I'd love to come and travel. We've been tra I've been traveling a ton recently. I mean, almost every weekend for the last maybe month and a half, two months, I've been out of town um, speaking on some of these issues. Uh, this last week I was in El Centro, which was in California. I didn't realize how, I mean, I realized how big California is, but just not to the South. I live in Southern California. Well, I was five hours South of me and I'm still in California, which is incredible. It was, we had a great time. Um, <clears throat> we got to talk about the problem of evil. We got to talk about um, a, a bunch of great topics did a Q and a, and on Saturday it was, it was a fantastic opportunity. So anyways, um, with that guys, I'm going to get going. Cause I'm going to go do this filming at UCI as always. It is an absolute pleasure being with you. Uh, I'm John noise for stand the reason this is to the point and I will see you in two weeks. I'll talk to you then. Bye-bye.